Hello, welcome to week five of Organized Crime, CGUS 4375, or 76, whatever it is. Uh, welcome to Organized Crime, week five. Uh, this week we'll be talking, I'll be talking about uh, select Asian and Russian and European organized crime groups. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about the Yakuza, um, the Triads, the Trong, the Tong, uh, Russian organized crime, and I'll end this week with a with a uh, discussion of the Kurdish the Kurdish Workers Party, uh, which could be either an organized crime group or a terrorist group. And one of the questions on the final exam asks you to evaluate. Uh, where the PKK, or the Kurdish Workers' Party, stands. And so um, I've, I've, I've worked on um, uh, worked on a special segment of the lecture uh, to talk about the terrorist activity of the PKK uh, so that you would have that information uh, to go with what Dr. Roth puts in his textbook about their criminal uh, organization, their criminal activities. And so, um, uh, well, before I get started, I do also want to remind you um, that... Uh, your term papers are due in two weeks. They're due on the Monday of week seven by midnight. And that the deadline for drafts is the Monday of this week. Uh, and so if you have not sent me a draft by the end of uh, the day on April 2nd, um, I will not be reviewing drafts uh, submitted after, after tonight at midnight. Or after April 2nd at midnight, I shouldn't say tonight, in case you're not viewing this on April 2nd. Okay, that being done, let's get started. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, starting out with the Yakuza, um, which is, the Yakuza is Japanese, is a, is a generic name uh, for Japanese organized crime. Uh, it is a name derived from a Japanese card game called Yuchi Kubu. Um, and it's it's a game that's kind of like blackjack, only the number you're trying to beat without exceeding is 19 instead of 21. And in Japanese, um, uh, yakuza, the words ya uh, is is the number eight, ku is the number nine, za is the number three, which adds up to 20. Which in uh, uchikabu is a worthless hand, and so yakuza is quite literally. Uh, useless hands in society, and that's certainly how uh, the, gener the general uh, Japanese public views uh, the Yakuza and its members. Um, the Yakuza's origins uh, stretch back uh, to the 15th century uh, with uh, a group called the Crazy Ones, the Kabuki Mono. Uh, these Kabuki Mono, they were uh, former servants of a shogun um, who terrorized communities. They were, uh, you know, as, as, as an end of warfare and conflict between shogun uh, ended uh, during what they called to, a, a period of Tokuwa, Tagugawa, or peace, uh, or the, two, uh, the, the Takugawa era of Japan, these kabuki mono, or crazy ones, became unemployed, and many of them became ronin, uh, which is a Japanese term meaning uh, a masterless samurai. Uh, many ronin became mercenary. Um, it was very... He lost a lot of face. If you were a samurai, who was, you know, samurai is a warrior, a uh, samurai who becomes masterless, who becomes ronin, loses face and may be considered as a mercenary. Many of these uh, ronin became... Uh, criminals uh, and and under uh, they became criminals. Different they formed groups that came with various names. Uh, they developed a slang language of their own. Uh, now, mind you, if you ask a member of the Yakuza today uh, about this particular uh, story of their past, they will deny uh, that they were ever Ronin. Uh, or rather, they will claim that they are descendants of the Machiaku. Um, Basically, this is a term meaning city servants. Uh, the Machiaku were considered to be uh, protectors, uh, generic protectors of the people. Um, uh, that's what the, the, you ask the Yakuza themselves, that's what they'll tell you. Um, 
but really the criminals in Japanese society, they, uh, they formed various groups, they formed various societies, uh, and so you have uh, varying origins of different groups, and, so, and, and usually based on a crime type. Uh, the gamblers, uh, you know, were a group known as the, Baku, the, the Bakutu, B-A-K-U-T-O, you know, kind of an Anglicized version of the Japanese word. Uh, you have the Takiya, T-E-K-I-Y-A, which were kind of street peddlers. Uh, you had the Uyaku, or O-Y-U-Y-O-K-U. Um, they were, uh, the Uyaku were your political right-wing individuals. And then you had your uh, st- common street thugs, also known as uh, uh, Yoku or uh, U-Y-O-K-U, which I find interesting that the political right-wing and the common criminal thug kind of have the same group name. Hey, not my study, it's just telling you what I learned. Um, but whether, regardless of what group, whether they were uh, Uyoko, or they were Takia, uh, or, or, or Makuto, uh, they all kind of had some common characteristics in that they were all landless, uh, again, ronin if they were you know, warriors beforehand, samurai. Uh, they were poor, they were misfits, they were characterized as both worthless and violent. Um, regardless, they formed... Uh, these folks ended up, these criminals tended to band together and form families or clans uh, based on class or family relationships. Uh, and so you see uh, the Bakuto and the Kaya and the Uyako uh, uh, being groups. During the industrialization era in Japan, uh, you saw these criminal groups ally themselves with capitalists. And, and, and through this alliance, they would provide cheap labor uh, to the factories. Um, they would, uh, very similar to La Cosa Nostra's uh, racketeering activities, you know, they would, not only they would provide um, cheap labor to the, the, the factories and the industries, uh, but they would also extort money from the factories by saying, well, you can pay us money or we can, we can make sure your workers go on strike, you know pay us or you make no money. Um, you know, they were also uh, sometimes employed as, as uh, violent strike breakers. Uh, when strikes were, when you had strikes that weren't organized by uh, these criminal groups, these Yakuza, um, so the Yakuza would step in uh, under the employee of a company to break the strikes. In the uh, 19, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, you see uh, the Yakuza exploiting uh, the social and industrial change in Japan. Uh, they did a lot of their recruiting from uh, uh, from, from shipping and construction industries. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Particularly the recruiting from construction industries. I remember where Yakuza Nostra, the Sicilian Mafia, uh, did a lot of their business with construction. Um, they began to cooperate. Here's something a little different, uh, where the, the La Cosa Nostra with the Italian mob, and, and, and I will try to point out, everyone else will point out differences between uh, the groups we talk on, talk about from here on out and La Cosa Nostra and you know, uh, the Sicilian mob, because there is a question on the final about, um, yeah, there are several questions on the final about comparing say, Japanese preparing, or we'll give you an example, this question on the final that asks you to compare Japanese and Chinese organized crime to each other, compare and contrast them to each other, but then also take Asian organized crime in general and compare those to other organized crime types that are operating in the United States. And so you might um, take note, you know, I'll try to point out some of these differences as I go, if I remember. And one of these interesting differences is where uh, the Sicilian mob kind of kept their nose down, and while they involved themselves in corrupting the of- officials, the Yakuza, on the other hand, made peace with we made peace with the law enforcement. And they began to cooperate with authorities, and and actually developed a fairly favorable relationship uh, with Japanese police. At the end of World War II, uh, and here's a, here's another common thread. Um, just like uh, the Sicilian Mafia, uh, the end of World War II spelled opportunity 
uh, for growth and wealth for the Yakuza. Uh, there was a vast rise in membership during the U.S. occupation of Japan uh, after the war ended. And the rise in membership had a lot to do with food shortages uh, in Japan. Uh, that, caused, that created an opportunity for a vast black market uh, that a Yakuza group called the Gurentai, G-U-R-E-N-T-A-I, a uh, group of street hustlers and hoodlums, uh, mostly former Japanese militiamen uh, who patterned themselves after the American Mafia. Um, they kind of liked the image that Capone and some of the other mobsters were portraying. And so these Gorentai uh, try to kind of, they wore a lot of dark suits, a lot of sunglasses, and if you see, even see the Yakuza today, um, you'll see that as kind of a pattern, almost a uniform for them, the, the black suits, white shirt, black tie, sunglasses, um, you know, kind of looks kind of looks stereotypical, and sometimes you might see it in the movie, and you go, nah, it can't be real, well, yeah, uh, it is. Um, they gained a lot of power because the Gorentai uh, took over the black market, they, they merged with the Bakutu and the, and the Teriyaya, and the uh, Teriyayu, <laughs> Uh, formed the other groups, the, the other groups I talk about, the street peddlers and uh, the common thubs, the, the Iyoko and the Bakato and the Terekyo, um, uh, merged with these other groups. The Garantai uh, then became more diverse, uh, you know, moved on from just their black market activities. Um, and really between 1958 and 1963, uh, you see the Yakuza uh, with the Garantai as kind of a central group. Uh, growing to about 184,000 members, uh, which was actually in those during those years uh, larger than the Japanese army itself. Um, you know, they're a little smaller today, but they still the yakuza has a large presence in Japan. Uh, there were, but while there were that many of them, they were very. They were split. I mean, the Yakuza, remember the Yakuza that I said at the beginning, uh, is a generic term for Japanese organized crime. There is no single group that's called the Yakuza. It is, you know, the Yakuza itself is a collection of organized crime groups uh, that come under, it's a generic term. It's kind of like mafia uh, or mob is a generic term for Sicilian or Italian-American uh, organized crime in the United States. Uh, there were somewhere around 5,000 of these criminal groups uh, in Japan, and they tended to compete with one another, and, and sometimes that competition was quite uh, violent. Uh, the Yakuza was, the Yakuza as a term was formalized, some say it was formalized in the early 1960s, uh, by a man named Yoshio uh, Kadama, uh, K-A or K-O-D-A-M-A. Uh, Kadama was uh, a thug. Uh, he was one of the uh, Yoko or the U Y O K O kind of Yoko people. Um, but he established during World War II. World War II, he established a spy network in China. Um, and uh, at some point during the in the Japanese Navy, actually rose to the rank of rear admiral. Um, along the way, he had a private company. Uh, he, he dealt in uh, supplies, largely nickel, copper, uh, cobalt, and heroin. Uh, his, his own company, the Kodami, Kil, uh, Kodami Kilkan, uh, was actually estimated uh, to be worth about $75 million when we're talking $1960. Um, but uh, Kodama was briefly imprisoned for, as, uh, for war crimes. Uh, but was actually asked by Allied Command to broker the peace between these 5,000 groups that are competing with one another uh, for control of the black market and other organized crime activities in Japan. And so Kodama, very successful in doing it, he, he took primarily took five groups and formed them together into uh, a peace between them. And then these... Five groups form the nucleus of what we call Yakuza today, though keep in mind these are still five separate groups. And Yakuza, while we might say these groups were brought together to form the Yakuza, keep in mind, you know, we would say the fam the five families in New York together form the mafia, but that 
is both true and not true in that there really isn't one single mafia, but there are the five families that are heavily aligned with one another in New York or in other cities. Uh, these five groups, uh, the Kazu, uh, Toaku, T-A-O-K-U, uh, these are the, the, the Yamaguchi Gumi, and we'll talk, I'll talk about the Yamaguchi Gumi uh, a little bit more later, uh, the Tose Kai, which is a Korean organized crime group running in Japan, uh, the Kanto Kai, uh, and the Ngawa Kai, uh, these uh, four groups, these are not five, four groups, will form the nucleus of this Yakuza piece. Uh, the Yamaguchi Gumi, this is the one that I, I, I told you uh, that I would tell you a little bit more because they're the, Yamagu, the Yamaguchi Gumi, uh, Y-M-A-G-U-C-H-I dash G-U-M-I, so it's actually two words, Yamaguchi Gumi. Uh, this crime group is considered the largest Yakuza group in Japan. Um, their power is largely attributed to uh, their third Oyaban, or leader, uh, a man named Kazu Tauka, T-A-O-K-A. Uh, my Japanese pronunciation is no better than my Italian, sorry. Um, they were also led uh, by a, uh, probably one of the more famous mem leaders uh, or Oyabans of the group, uh, a man named Yosh Yosh Yoshinori Watanabe, W-A-T-A-N-B-E, uh, this Wanatambi, born in 1941, son of farmers, uh, grew up as a restaurant worker in Tokyo, uh, dropped out in middle school. Hey, there's another, yeah, how many times have we heard that story talking about organized crime? Dropped out of school at age 14. I don't know what age he dropped out, but middle school, kind of around that age. Uh, he moved to Kobe, Japan, uh, got involved. Uh, with the Yamakagumi, which is a, a subgroup of the Yamagachi Gumi, around 1960, um, he demonstrated so much. He, he demonstrated such powerful leadership skills that he rose very quickly uh, in this crime group. Uh, and when the group began having trouble, uh, trouble that, that law enforcement, they got the group was had so much internal trouble that law enforcement was pretty sure they were going to end the Yamagachi Gumi were done for. Um, that that when Atambi, uh, this happened in the 1980s. Uh, one of Tommy actually brought the group together and took control. Um, he changed the group structure. He split them. He, he splitting their centralized power into seven regional groups. Uh, brought new alliances online. Actually grew the Yamagachi Gumi uh, to 165,000 people. Uh, keep in mind, this is more people than the Sicilian Mafia has ever had uh, at one time. Um, under their leadership, under one of Tommy's leadership, uh, the Yamagachi Kumi, again, this largest Yakuza group, um, actually survived Japan's depression uh, and Japan's crackdown on organized crime. What's the Yakuza like today? Well, their members are different than the old days of the Ronin. Uh, they are very economically motivated, more so than ever. Uh, they are mostly high school dropouts which makes them very, very different uh, from some of the, the, the elite of the Russian mob that we'll talk about this week as well. Um, they, uh, most of the, most people join, most members join the, the Yakuza uh, because they're looking for, uh, to get rich, uh, because there's some glamour attached uh, to being a member uh, of the, the Yakuza. And most of them were had delinquent pasts uh, and had made it have been drug users. What about the United States? Uh, the Yakuza, various different Yakuza groups have been active uh, in the United States since the 1950s. Uh, and you know, in a similar manner to how they're, they're, they're active in Japan. Um, they are heavily, they are typically involving, they're a very uh, group uh, capable of rapid evolution. Uh, and changed based on economic or political or uh, law enforcement circumstances. Uh, since the 1990s, uh, we've seen a lot of growth in Yakuza in, in Japan, uh, largely as they've moved into arms trading and real estate. Uh, but also, just like they are in Japan, the Yakuza is... I'm going to make sure I don't talk about well, I'll just have to remember I talked about it. Um, in Japan, uh, the Yakuza is much more open about who they are. 
than other organized crime groups. I mean, it's not hard. You want to go talk to a member of the Yakuza, it's not all that hard. Um, their headquarters are marked with their clan symbols. I mean, you can see them. Um, they're a little more sneaky in the United States, but one of the things in Japan the Yakuza isn't heavily involved in is involved in legitimate business and stock ownership of legitimate business. Well, they do the same thing here in the United States, and i got to tell you, when I told my residential students about this, about some of this, uh, they really freaked. Um, because I just want to give you a little list of U.S. corporations uh, where members of the Yakuza have significant uh, stock holdings in. Um, even kind of messed me over a little because I, um, I have money in a couple of these banks. Anyway, uh, I'll just give you a, uh, stock ownership, and, and not majority stock ownership, but significant stock holdings uh, in such U.S. companies as Chase, Citicorp, IBM, Dow Chemical, Bank of America and General Motors. Uh, how many of you have just went, you I got money in that bank. Uh, yeah, I got money in two of them. No, I understand. Um, their influence expands. The Yakuza has, uh, in addition to the United States, they are expanding rapidly in other nations. Um, and they do a lot of it through <laughs> corporate uh, ties. Um, they are very different in this in this. You know, while other organized crime groups get involved in legitimate business as a tool for money laundering or a tool to help smuggle smuggle goods, uh, Yakuza groups uh, use stock ownership uh, in big companies as a way to make money and as a way to influence uh, large companies. When we talk about, let me talk a little bit about structure of uh, the Yakuza, and, and again, Yakuza, generic term for organized crime in Japan, and so this structure I'm going to talk to you about is kind of a generic generic hierarchy, uh, and there may be variations from specific Yakuza uh, between specific Yakuza. Um, the Yakuza, much like the Sicilian mob, is, 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 is thought by some to be based on a patron-client uh, relationship. Uh, the Yakuza is kind of based on Oyaban Kuban relationship. And Oyaban is Japanese word for father, Kuban Japanese word for child, but very similar to patron client relationship. Uh, a Yakuza clan or Yakuza group uh, is going to be led. Uh, their leader is called an Oyaban. And he will be the leader of the group, the CEO, the chairman, uh, the, the big cheese, so to speak. Uh, there are three individuals at the level of the hierarchy below the Oyaban. Um, to one side is the uh, Seiko Koman, S A I K O K O M O N. This is a senior advisor, and his responsibility is to supervise and control the bookkeepers and the advocates, read attorneys, uh, and the secretary for the organization. And he will have his own Koban, he will have his own little gang under him of children as well. So it's not just. You know, he's not like a consingulary where all he does is advise the boss. Here, the senior advisor, he handles the bookkeeping, the accounting. He even runs his own, you know, his own crew. Next to him in power is the Waka Gashira, uh, W A K A dash K S no G A S H I R A uh, Waka Gashira. Uh, this is your number two man. Uh, this is the person responsible. This is almost like uh, this is the equivalent of an underboss in La Cosa Nostra. Uh, this is the guy responsible for carrying out the Oyaban's orders. And under him in the hierarchy, he's got a bunch of Kuban. He's a children. You know, he would be the father in the relationship, and then all these Kuban children under him. Uh, and then under there is just the standard hierarchy down, you know, two or three levels of children and children under that. Now, also on this rank of the hierarchy, you know, we have Oyaban, and then one steady level, you have Seiko Koman, uh, or Seiko Koman, Waka Gashira, and then you have the Shati Gashira, uh, S-H-A-T-E-I uh, Gashira, who is technically higher in rank than the Waka Gashira, but has less authority. I'm not sure how that works out, but it does. Um, and then that individual, he has... Uh, more of kind of a training relationship, uh, but then that individual also has his own gangs under him um, and individuals at work. Um, 
they commit crimes. And kind of the way the organizations grow is underneath one of these three big leaders, they'll have a koban or a child, and that will be like a soldier or someone that does the dirty work. And then as that person gains in prestige, um, you know, as he is, uh, becomes kumen or, uh, kumen or a member, uh, he may start his own little gang of, of kuban. Uh, first, those people would become junko men or associates, and they would eventually become kumen of their own. And that's how they gain power, or how they gain size, is each level, you, know, you have your own little kuban or children that work under you, and then each one of those, as they gain enough prestige, they get to start a gang of their own, and all the money flows upwards. Um, of course, regardless of what level you're at, uh, in the Yakuza, you do have to follow a very strict code of conduct, uh, with precepts such as never reveal secrets of the organization, uh, never violate the wife or child of another, uh, don't withhold money from the clan, don't fail to obey superiors, um, don't become involved in narcotics. Keep in mind, that doesn't mean don't sell narcotics, that means don't use them. Uh, and then don't appeal to the law or police, and pretty much that means don't make deals with the police. Um, punishments for breaking the code of conduct among the Yakuza, um, pretty well, I wouldn't say that it is also a big difference. I mean, uh, you know, you violate Omerta and La Cosa Nostra, uh, punishment's real easy, two in the back of the head, uh, or some sort of gruesome death. Uh, and the Yakuza's a little different. Now, for the most serious offenses, the punishment is lynching. Um, and that can only be approved by the Oyaba. But there are lesser crimes uh, and punishments for lesser crimes. Uh, there is uh, the Yubits, uh, Yubitsume, Y-U-B-I-T-S-U-M-A, Yubit, Yubitsume, which is the amputation of fingers. Um, that's kind of rare today. That's a tra Yakuza tradition. And it harkens back to a day where these where these guys were Ronin, where they were you know, sword-carrying soldiers, and the loss of a finger, the amputation of a finger on a sword hand, um, affected the soldier's ability to control his blade. Uh, and so that made it kind of a, um, you know, a serious punishment. Um, they still do some of that today. In fact, you know, uh, it's very easy to identify. Remember the Yakuza, you look for a Japanese man missing a finger and covered in tattoos, and you go, ah, Yakuza. Uh, fairly good to pick out. There is the Zet, Zet Sumen, Z E T S U E M. Uh, Zet Suim, this is a severing of the relationship between the Oyaban and the offender. Uh, this is not a permanent sev relationship. Severing as you know, the individual can uh, gain honor again, can over time work his way back into the organization. Um, that is different from the Hamon, H-A-M-O-N, which is a permanent exile from the Yakuza and all the protections that would come with it. Um, let's see, what else do I want to do? What else to talk about? Um, I talk about the fingers as being an identifying mark. Another, another way that members of the Yakuza can easily be identified uh, is by their tattoos. Um, they do a bodysuit style of tattooing uh, that is uh, very distinctive. In fact, in the past, uh, this was a type of tattooing that was um, associated with their criminals. Uh, as, as you were, uh, if you were a criminal and you were arrested, you would have... Uh, these uh, armband tattoos put on. Um, or your crimes were marked by yeah, armband tattoos. Oh, for a second, I got them confused with the Russians who do something very similar. Um, in fact, they do something exactly similar. Uh, it was uh, considered to be a mark of shame to have these uh, tattoos. But, and as I'm talking, I'm flipping through the book to see if there's a picture of... I can't remember if, if, if Mitch included a picture of... Uh, of a Yakuza man, uh, Yakuza member in his tattoos. Uh, but this body style tattooing, uh, while considered shameful by mainstream Japanese society, uh, is for a member of the Yakuza a symbol of strength and masculinity. And we're not talking uh, little bitsy tattoos, you know, I got a little dinosaur or I got a little uh, a dolphin on my back. This is uh, tattoos that almost look like you're wearing a shirt. Um, just solid tattoo, 
covering the individual's body, and it doesn't look like, you know, Mitch didn't include a, a picture of a tattooed member of the Yapuza. What a shame. I'm sure you can find one on the internet. Um, when you join, in addition to the tattooing, uh, you're required to pay a membership fee to the Oyabon, and then you know you continue paying up the ladder as you go. And of course, your Oyabon is going to be the person directly above you, uh, who will have as an Oyabon of his own. And that is. Oh wait a minute! I've got more about the Yakuza to talk about. Um, just got some specific things I want to mention about. Uh, comparing and contrasting them, I want to point out some specific differences between them and the other organized crime groups. Um, they do have similar origins in that they use economic and social conditions in Japan to gain control after World War II, kind of just like Sicilian Mafia. Um, they do use violence and corruption to achieve their goals. And so they're similar to other organized crime in that fashion. However, unlike other types of organized crime, uh, they tend to have an ultimate, they do not have the ultra-nationalistic, conservative, or anti-communist political leanings of groups like the Sicilian Mafia, uh, or the Russian Mafia, for that matter. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, they keep, like I alluded to earlier, uh, they keep a very, very public image. Um, you know, because there was a peace between the Yakuza and the Japanese police, uh, the Yakuza didn't feel the need to hide or be a secretive, as say the Italian mob. And so, you know, their headquarters are well marked. I mean, every clan has its own little symbol. Um, in fact, the typical uniform of a Yakuza member, you know, I just talked about the black suit I described, and usually they'll have a pin with their clan emblem on it. And these clan emblems are on the front of their building. When you walk around downtown Tokyo, uh, and you can see these buildings, the clan emblem, you'll see armed uh, security out front. They're very blatant about it. Um, and so that makes them very different. Um, they are more technological, technologically savvy than most other types of organized crime. In fact, um, other than some elements of the Russian mob, uh, the Yakuza is probably one of the more technologically advanced uh, more technological savvy, has the most technological savvy of organized crime groups. Um, they are very concerned with their public image, um, more so than other groups. I mean, we, we've seen uh, various organized crime groups or for various individuals try to, uh, try to foster a benevolent, benevolent ish, image, you know, to make them feel like uh, to build themselves up as an image of being uh, popular, or build themselves up an image of being a, a benefactor of the community, the Yakuza as a whole, um, or in general, Yakuza groups try to create a public image that uh, is often, and as a result, often contributes to good causes, uh, and it is not uncommon for the Yakuza to be uh, first responders during natural disasters. Um, you know, the tsunami that hit uh, the devastated parts of Japan last year, uh, including uh, causing a great deal of damage to some of their nuclear reactors. Uh, the Yakuza, uh, several Yakuza groups were the very first, brought the very first relief trucks that showed up, uh, were owned and paid for uh, uh, by the Yakuza. And we're talking about March 2000. 11, put this in uh, terms that I'm using this video in future classes. Um, they actually showed up with about 70 trucks worth of supplies, about half a million dollars uh, worth of food and water and other types of supplies. Um, one Yakuza member was quoting their paper uh, in, the, in one of the newspapers in Japan as saying, and this was during, this was shortly after the aftermath of the tsunami, uh, this one Yakuza member, he says, there are no Yakuza or Katayi or Gaijin in Japan right now. We are all Japanese, and we all need to help one another. Now, before you get the wrong idea about these uh, Yakuza's being generally nice guys, once all the relief efforts were done, they started taking advantage, just like, just like the Sicilians did in Palermo, taking advantage of reconstruction efforts. The Yakuza have stepped in 
you know, started taking advantage uh, by trying to control the reconstruction efforts uh, um, in, uh, in the aftermath of the tsunami. But I would note that, again, with that special relationship they have with the Japanese police, um, the attitude of the Japanese police is that as long as the Yakuza is doing something for the benefit of the public, they're not going to interfere. And, you know, so the, you know, the police show up and they, and they see uh, known gangster, you know, known criminals, uh, they're helping out with the relief efforts and the police leave them alone. You know, they're bringing in uh, a large number of relief, relief supplies. And, you know, in a way, I don't blame the Japanese police for uh, standing by and saying, you know, we're not going to mess with these people while we're doing this. Let's see. Uh, business, act different activities. Uh, different things the Yakuza gets involved in. Uh, start with business acquisition. Uh, their favorite thing to do is to identify businesses in financial trouble, make a great number of fraudulent deals, uh, ensuring that the business will collapse. And of course, they have, uh, will take advantage of that. Uh, they, their favorite targets are uh, businesses that deal with tourism. Uh, and you know their deal is they'll come to the business. They'll say, okay, uh, here's our offer. We'll bring we'll stir tourists your way. You give us a cut of the profits. And if you're the business owner, and you say no, then they uh, they threaten you and eventually you know, use violence to convince you uh, that you that, that you'd like to accept their help. Um, the Yakuza gets into protection extortion, just like La Cosa Nostra. You know protection for price. Uh, much like the LCN, their gambling is based around sports betting. Uh, their largest revenue source is narcotics trafficking. Um, pre prefer, they prefer to get into amphetamine and methamphetamine uh, and some cocaine trafficking. Um, they are also involved in pornography and prostitution, um, especially since hardcore pornography is illegal in Japan. And uh, one of their one of the Yakuza specializations is importing U.S. women, which apparently U.S. women uh, can ask and get uh, come for a good price uh, as prostitutes. Uh, they're also into smuggling weapons. Um, one note I found said that U.S. made weapons are worth about ten times their value in Japan. Uh, and you know because they own most, <laughs> since they own a large number of the banks in Japan, uh, they are of course. <laughs> Heavily in the money laundering. Okay, right, that's enough about Japan. Um, let me talk uh, for a while about the triads and the tong. Um, and they are uh, different groups. Uh, triads are uh, Hong Kong based organized crime. And, uh, well, before I, before I start breaking the triad and tong, actually, you know what? I'm going to end this here. This is about 40 minutes. So I'm going to break here. And then I'll do a separate video for the triad and the draw tongue. That way it kind of gives you a break. It's your natural place to break. Uh, 